My name, as uh, Simon said, is Nick. I'm uh, the creative, um, I'm the community manager for design and technology. So that means I work with creators um, in those two categories of Kickstarter. So Kickstarter is broadly speaking a creative platform. So that serves um, art projects, music projects, dance, things that you would more typically think of artistic projects. But also we have, um, have a, a growing number of people using it to produce um, technology and design projects. And it's, uh, that's what I'm be talking about today, kind of my work with those communities. And you can see these are some of the projects out back. A little bit of my background, so I'm an alum of NYU's ITP program, and I currently teach there, and I do a lot of design and development work on um, installations and commercial development myself. And um, before going to ITP, I uh, was a manager of a recording and archive department at the National Oral History Project Story Corps. So I have a long-standing interest in sort of connecting people and communities with the use of technology. So as I said, Kickstarter's mission is to help bring creative projects to life, and that's everything from dance, to food, to apps, to hardware, and over the five years we've been operating, um, 64,000 projects have been successfully funded with Kickstarter, um, about 6.4 million backers, and then of those 6.4 million backers, we've seen about 2 million, about a third of those are repeat backers. So what that means is there's people who have come to the platform, probably to support one project, but have stuck around and continue to be part of the Kickstarter community and discover new things. And that's really what we're most excited about forming this community on Kickstarter who want to support just new ideas in general. So over those five years, um, over a billion dollars have been funded to start these creative projects. Um, here's a little bit of a breakdown, you can see how it's distributed internationally. And then I pulled some numbers just for the design and technology categories. Um, overall, these categories represent about 20% of all projects through Kickstarter, um, and always growing. And then it's about 25% of the total line rates. You can see today there's been about 8,000 design projects launched in Kickstarter, about 5,000 technology projects. And I, I'm talking about these in general together, and my title is Design and Technology because it really is a fluid boundary. We see um, you know, people launching hardware projects, connected devices in the design category, also in the, the technology category, which includes software and apps. We have a number of subcategories that represent um, a really diverse and broad range of creators. So, for instance, in technology, we have a category for hardware, which has a lot of the kind of Projects you've probably heard more about, like the Pebble um, and you know, Neil Young's Pono Player, these big name projects that get all the press coverage. We also have, for instance, in that category, a space -like exploration subcategory. So a lot of people creating like tiny satellite projects to work on NASA challenges. We've got a flight category that has a lot of drone projects. So it really is quite diverse. And we have a software category um, for apps and websites and a lot of growth in that space. So how does Kickstarter work? Um, so the basic mechanism for, for our site is you basically um, are presenting your idea to a group of people who want to support it. And you're, you're kind of structuring it by saying, this is the amount of money I need to raise, so your funding goal. And you're saying, this is the period of time over which I'm going to raise it. Um, so the, the average time people pick is 30 days. You can pick up to 60 days. But what our data shows is that going beyond that 30 day window is not really, there's not any advantage in gain. In some cases, um, actually sustaining interest and kind of just the resources it takes to run a campaign beyond those 30 days can actually make things more difficult for you. So, you know, you may have compelling reasons for making it longer, but in general, 30 days is what we recommend. And so Kickstarter is an all or nothing funding campaign. So that means that you reach your goal, then that funding goes through, those people are charged. Um, if you don't reach your goal, then no money changes hands. We don't take any kind of a fee. People who back the project are not charged. And so why, why do we think that this is the right solution? Why is this the right way to do it? I mean, the short answer is that, um, you know, if you need $5,000 to make your thing, and you only raise $3,000, that puts you in a bad position, and that puts the people who back your project in a bad position. So it's really important to us that you're upfront about what your needs are for the project, and it's sort of a way for people to pipe up and say, like, yes, we, we think that this is worth supporting on that level. Um, so in a way, it's less risk for everybody. It makes sure that you're sort of vetting your idea and that you're giving people a realistic sense of what it actually takes to do that. Beyond that, though, it really, um, it's a great motivating factor for people to get behind a project. So it encourages participation, and it really is compelling. So if you have this limited time period over which you are trying to fund a project, and you really need to hit that goal, it's a much more convincing appeal to go to your committee and say, we really need your help at this point. Rather than it being more sort of a tip jar model where you've put your idea out there and if somebody happens to like it, they can kind of stop by and give you some money. It's a great way to really motivate people and get your community to form around you. So in terms of funding success, and I'm sorry about the, uh, the contest of these slides here. Um, 
So 44% of the projects across the site are successful. And, and just to clarify, we're defining success in this case as reach the funding goal. I mean, it's really not as binary as that. We have plenty of examples of people who you know, didn't reach their funding goal, but were still able to regroup later, come back to a phenomenally successful Kickstarter, or even just use those backers who did pledge as sort of um, you know, their mailing list for the next stage of the project. And when they were able to regroup and kind of think through a little bit more, we're still able to successfully bring something to market, even if it didn't happen through Kickstarter. So success in this case is we're talking about the funding goal, but there, there's many success stories that go beyond just that statistic. Um, and you know, beyond that, we, we find that a quarter of projects that, that don't meet their goal don't even get a single pledge. So what that means is that's people who are not even telling anybody about the fact that they've put this on Kickstarter. So that's obviously an important lesson. You're bringing people to the platform. You need to tell people about it. So thinking about those, uh, it, it really is as far as campaigns that have actually actively engaged and actively tried to bring people to the project, the success rate is much higher. Um, and then you know, when you're successful, when you successfully reach that goal, our fee is 5%. Um, and that's, that's how we sustain the site. And that's, um, <laughs> that's how you're contributing to our group. And so setting a funding goal is obviously an important thing to figure out when you're, you're thinking about how you're going to approach this project. So there's a lot of different ways to think about it. I mean, on the base level, as I mentioned, you should make sure that it is enough to make sure that you can successfully carry out the project. And this can be in conjunction with other funding you have. It's not necessarily that you have to have every piece of your budget covered with your Kickstarter campaign, but make sure you know what your path to success is if you reach your funding goal. Um, but beyond that, people have different ways of defining what success means for them. So maybe breaking even and being able to just cover your costs to do initial tooling and get your product out there is success. Maybe you feel like you actually need to turn a profit. Um, and then how does this funding goal fit into your future plans for your company? Many people launch a new business on Kickstarter. Many people are taking an existing business and just trying to get their next product out there. So these are all important things for you to think about, all things that impact that amount of money you need to get. And sometimes people feel like, oh, I need to pick a million dollar funding goal because it will broadcast to the world that I'm a big deal and that like, a lot of people should pay attention to the project. And it obviously doesn't work that way. You should be as transparent about why you're raising this money and kind of be as honest with yourself about what you actually need when you're doing that. Um, and so what we've discovered kind of through our data is that the tipping point for successful funding in a project is about 30%. So 90% of projects that raise 30% of their goal will go on to succeed. So if your goal is $1,000 and you raise $300, of that, you have a 90% shot um, at actually completing that goal. Um, and then drilling down even a little further, projects that raise even just 10% of their goal, 75% of those succeed. So what this means is that if you've got a core idea that you can get at least you know, a base audience excited about it, you've got a really good shot at actually reaching that goal. It's getting that initial community together and kind of getting them to continue to spread the word and kind of bring you to that, that finish line. Um, and so, so how does Kickstarter work? I mean, for us, fundamentally, it's about storytelling. It's about you presenting your idea in a compelling way that invites people to become part of that story. So it's not just about, you know, a commercial pitch. It's not just saying, this is a product that's going to make your life better. Thank you very much. It's saying, you know, this is the team of people who are creating this project. This is the journey that we've been on. We're showing you examples of our development process, and we're talking about why we really want you to be part of this process. Um, it's really inviting people to, even with a $1 pledge, kind of subscribe to that story and kind of hear updates and be part of what your project is. So the mechanisms through which you do that, um, so one very important one is the project video. Um, so Kickstarter is a very video-driven site. Um, it's really the way that most people kind of communicate their ideas and the way that most backers will, you know, first hear about an idea and kind of be compelled to take part. Um, and this is, as I was saying, this is not a commercial pitch necessarily. It's not just a kind of a glib assessment of why this project is important. It's inviting people to meet you, to understand why you care about this project and kind of the work you've done up to this point. And so showing behind the scenes footage of your prototyping process or you know, showing things that inspire you and have brought you along this process is, are just as important in this project video as a clear and concise demonstration of the product itself. Another obviously important component is the rewards that you're offering. So Kickstarter is not a donation platform. It's not just you standing up there and saying, um, please give us money, it'll help us do this thing, thanks. Um, it's, it's an exchange, so if I'm giving $10 to a project, I should get $10 roughly some, of something in exchange. And, and so in some cases that actually means that I'm getting a product, so for many physical products and you know, hardware, that's a lot of the reason why people are back in the project, because they actually want the thing. Um, 
But that's not necessarily always the case. A lot of very successful rewards are less tangible and are more experiential. So if I'm creating an app, um, maybe it's really compelling for people to get um, beta access to that, if it's something they really care about and really want to be part of that process. Or maybe it's really important for somebody to be able to meet the creators. They, they really love what you're doing and they're willing to kind of give a little bit more of that experiential reward of getting to see where you've done all your R&D. Um, so get creative with the rewards. Don't always just think of it as a straight, you know, you're not just necessarily selling a product. But make sure you are providing value to somebody that's a compelling and it's not just asking for money. Um, I mean, there's great examples in a lot of the creative categories. So things like some people who are making films will even like get character, you know, you can back to have a character name that have some kind of input in the creative process. And there's all kinds of ways to incorporate that into a product and software as well. Um, so some key levels for rewards that we've seen across the site uh, from our data is $25 is the most common pledge. So that's where most people are deciding to step up and support a campaign. And then a $100 pledge is the one that generates the most funding. So most campaigns getting um, the majority of their funding through that level. So another really important component of the campaign and part of the process are project updates. So it's something that is people are often less familiar with um, than the rewards and and the kind of project landing page, but this is really the way that you continue to kind of keep your backers engaged and continue to tell the story both during the campaign and then after the campaign is wrapped up. So it's your stream of integration. It goes right into the inboxes of your backers, and it's your choice. You can make it either private for just backers or it can be public so it's something that everybody can see. But, but again, it's, it's the way that you kind of answer questions people have, so often it's an opportunity to say there's a, a demonstration that's more detailed or more specific than you wanted to get into with your main project video, but it's a question that's coming up a lot from backers. It's a great way to drill into more detail and say, like, I wanted to show you this feature of the product that a lot of you asked about, and then send that out in the campaign. And, it, and getting those updates in your inbox is, it's, it's important to remember that your backers are not, they're still, they're still a very valuable resource. They're not people who you have in your pocket already. They are your opportunity to keep spreading the word about the project. So updates are a great way to keep them energized and keep giving them kind of new pitches, new information about your project that makes them want to share it further. So here's just a couple of examples of project updates. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig into kind of a case study of a successful ad project in a sec. We'll talk about some of the ways they use updates. And so, who are the backers? So the backers are essentially your kind of most engaged community. They're your early adapters, the people who are willing to raise their hand even at the beginning stage and say, I really care about what you're doing and I'm going to support it financially, but also I'm going to spread the word. So whether they're giving a dollar or they're giving $5,000, again, they're an asset to you as far as spreading information and excitement about the campaign. And they're also the ones who are kind of keeping you positive while you're doing this. It's great to have this affirmation of people who are writing and saying, I love what you're doing. Because um, it's very hard to make a so it's important to figure out who these people are, how they're finding about, how they're about your project, um, and then that, that way you can have a better sense of where you need to kind of focus your other communications and marketing efforts. Um, so what communities really are responding to this so you can dig deeper into this. I mean, it's not surprising probably that the majority of people who are the initial backers are going to be from your own community, your own network of people. So it's going to be your friends, your colleagues, people who through whatever other kind of showcases or events you've been able to talk about the product and who have sort of already given you their, their mailing address. So but it is very important that you are spending time building that network. It's, it's obviously not a news story anymore for somebody to be launching a Kickstarter campaign, so it's very important that the day you do launch, you're sending that out to what you consider to be your kind of strongest group of supporters so that they'll jump in right away and kind of give you a strong base to start from. I mean, it's also a great way to um, get feedback initially about your campaign. So, as anybody knows who's been involved in a lengthy creative process, it's very easy to have tunnel vision, for you to be focusing on one aspect of the process that you think is most important. But it's, it's often the case that there's completely obvious questions or completely obvious sort of things about the project or about the product that you're creating um, that, that you wouldn't think about. And so it's important to be sharing your campaign, sharing the way that you're presenting it to people who you trust and who you think represent the kind of core audiences you want to reach and get great feedback. Um, and then among that community of people who you're reaching out to, also think about press, people who have expressed interest in your, your product or what you're creating, people who have given you nice kind of write-ups on blogs and features. Great opportunity to, even before you launch your campaign, reach out to them and let you know what you're planning to do so that you can kind of line up some of that press in advance. I mean, so, on the whole, this whole conglomeration of people, of the backers you're, are, you already have who are going to be supporting you and who you'll be attracting through the campaign and the press that you're reaching out to, that's your community. 
that's the kind of, for us, even more important than funding on Kickstarter is that you're building a community of people who care about what you're doing. They're your first group of users, people who are going to be most vocal, most enthusiastic about what you're doing. And just, just kind of as a side note to too, we have many, many um, stories about people who have actually made hires out of their backers, out of the community of backers. So you may notice that while you're running your campaign and you're completely overwhelmed with the questions coming in in the comments section, and you notice that there are one or two backers who are always stepping up and sort of answering those questions on your behalf or always sort of your advocate, those are great people to kind of tap on the shoulder when the time comes to say, are you interested in having a kind of communications role in this? You clearly seem to love this product and be good at you know, expressing um, your interest in it. So plenty of examples of that, of people finding people to join the company just through the community of backers. So I'm going to jump in now to um, a project case study. And for, for this group, um, we're going to be looking at this really interesting weather app. So a, a data-driven, information-driven app. Um, that funded at the end of 2011 on Kickstarter. So Dark Sky, um, does anybody use Dark Sky? Do you even know about it? It's one of the most beautiful um, weather production apps um, out there. And they had a really novel take on what weather production even meant. So instead of it being something that was based on you know, a week-long, two-week-long projection, they were sort of asking the question, would it be possible to create an algorithm that synthesizes information and makes prediction for a specific location over the next couple of hours? So I can actually know, if I'm going to this park, is it going to rain? Um, and so they, they spent a lot of time developing this technology and then part of the Kickstarter. And so this is their, their just kind of project landing page. And you can see that over the course of the project, they, they um, raised about $40,000 um, from about 1,200 backers. Um, these are a couple of example images from their project page. So you can see that before even coming to Kickstarter, before even launching this, they had a fairly well-developed idea of what their user interface looked like, and they were able to communicate sort of the story of what their app is to potential users. Um, so this is really important, particularly with apps. We often people often think that they can kind of come to Kickstarter and say, "This is my big idea." Um, it's, you know, it's like Uber for helicopters. I'm sure that already exists, but like um, just kind of that one sentence elevator pitch, and then everybody's going to come to you because that idea is so compelling. And that's just not the case. You know, it really is important that you're communicating that idea, that kind of elevator pitch, that killer um, you know, reason why somebody should be interested in this, but also that you're demonstrating the work you've already done on it and giving people the confidence that not only do you have a great idea, but you have a great execution for that idea. You have the talent and kind of the knowledge to actually bring that to life in a compelling way. Here are a couple of examples of, this is from their rewards. So you can see um, their $50 reward is the most basic thing, as you imagine, you're just getting a copy of the app. Um, so that's going to be a bit more than it sells for in the App Store, but still, you know, if you really care about this and you're really excited about it, that's a very reasonable level on which to back and kind of to show your support. Um, going further, you can get the app in a t-shirt, obviously a very popular way of approaching things. Be really creative with the swag you're offering. You know, a lot of people have t-shirts already, so if there's something that's more specific that ties into the community you're trying to reach or the idea you're trying to create, that's a great idea. So these, the Dark Sky folks also offer um, this really, really beautiful umbrella. So obviously people who are backing this app care a lot about weather, and it's a nice sort of tie-in. Um, then taking a look at their kind of higher level um, awards, so for $500, you can get access to the beta, and you can be part of the sort of testing group and help them kind of refine the features. And so this is really exciting for somebody who may be a developer themselves, or maybe is interested in seeing kind of the back-end story of how this app is coming to life, and really understanding how these guys as developers are structuring their process, and then also, of course, just contributing to what you hope will be a great product. And then um, the $1,500 level, which they actually have seven backers for, so it's a pretty sizable chunk of their, their rewards there. Um, is getting that beta access, but then also sort of forming a business connection. So getting acknowledgement on the site and a link to a business website. So this is, again, another opportunity to, um, you're, you're, you're launching this product and you want to identify potential collaborators down the line. So more than likely the people who are backing this level also have an interest in doing something around weather or data or information and come to the tech space and see this as a cool opportunity to sort of partner with Dark Sky right from the get-go. So that's a really interesting thing to be able to offer, to already kind of put it out there that you're open to collaboration and kind of business partnerships as well. Um, another important thing, obviously, is talking about who you are. So this is, they, they chose a very sort of casual, minimal approach, which is fine. They're saying we're mild-mannered web developers. Um, uh, but they do link to their portfolio of the projects. So you may be a team of two people and just pointing people to your work is the most compelling way to show it. Or maybe you're a team of 15 people and you all have very specialized roles and 
you know, years of experience in other high profile projects. However you present it is up to you. Make sure it matches the tone of what you're trying to communicate, but make sure that you're giving people the confidence that you're the right team of people to pull this off. You know, just having a great idea is obviously not enough. Um, you have to be the right person to realize that idea. So this is an example of one of their updates. So this is the fifth update they posted, and this is actually the first update after the campaign won, uh, wrapped up. So they had already posted four updates while the campaign was live, just to kind of keep people in the loop about what, they were, what was happening with the campaign, and to kind of keep people excited. But this is the first sort of in-process update. So as I was saying, updates are a really important way to kind of keep people involved in the process and let them know. So they've all backed for this thing at this point, and they're excited to get it, and they want to know how the process is coming along, and make sure that it's not just this kind of wall of, I don't know what's happening in there. I really hope that they meet their targets. Um, so with this update, they're sharing um, kind of the work they've done on one of the user interfaces. So they're posting a video to Vimeo that shows the features that they've developed already. And then they're also announcing this really exciting thing that they've decided to launch an API for the underlying technology, um, this kind of weather prediction engine that they've created. So again, it's, it's a great way to pull people in who are developers themselves and who have expressed interest in that. And then the comments section is not only for the project itself, but each update has its own comments section as well. So in this case, so they, they posted that video demoing some features, and they're getting feedback on very, very um, specific features. So in this case, they're talking about whether a certain element wobbling to indicate uncertainty is effective. So they're getting feedback from people who are looking at that and in mid-process, like finding out whether that's an effective way to actually communicate the information. So obviously it's up to you. You can take it or leave it whether this is actually the user testing community that's of value to you. But it's worth considering because these are the people who are theoretically care most about what you're doing. And then this is the update that every user ever created loves to post, saying basically we have finished it and we're about to ship. So in this, in this uh, project's case, it means posting a link to iTunes where you can go and download the app. And it's just talking about you know, how happy they are to have had the support. But this is not where this is ended. So full two years plus later, they're still posting updates to their campaign. So when the next version of Dark Sky came out, it was still this community that they formed on Kickstarter that was important enough to continue kind of making that announcement to. So think about the, the Kickstarter campaign as what's happening over those 30 days, but it's also how it's also a channel for communicating with your most devoted followers, your core community throughout the life of the project, even after you've sent out and ship the project itself. It's still a really great channel for keeping people involved with what you're doing. And then this, these are just some screenshots from the current build of Dark So I'm going to talk a little bit about the tools you have as a creator. Um, so this is, um, as we looked at before, this is the front page for the project. This is what kind of the public view is. But there's a whole set of data tools as well that we, we give creators so they can kind of understand what's happening and how they're actually getting the funding. So this is a funding progress chart from the dashboard. Um, in this case, you can see, um, this is really interesting, the spike here on November 9th for Dark Sky came after they posted an update that basically gave a very detailed technical explanation of how they were, how, how their algorithm worked, how they were doing this. So that was sort of, in a way, kind of an alternate launch date for them because that drew, drove a lot of press coverage of the project and a lot of people had a different level of interest because they were, they were being able to get into a level of technical detail that they hadn't previously. So, Things like that, updates really can kind of spark new interest and bring new, new creators to the project or new backers to the project. And that's really the challenge. So as you imagine, the trajectory for most Kickstarter projects is a big spike in the beginning when you first announce it, and then you'll see a spike at the end where people who have been watching the project um, kind of jump on and say, all right, I want to back this. I've been watching this whole month. But to the extent that you can kind of control continued interest and kind of get through that plateau period that often happens in the middle through posting updates through making new announcements about the project, um, that's a great way to sustain interest. You can see the breakdown of refers in this case. So the green is from internal to Kickstarter, so whether it's on the home page or through other projects or project updates versus external. So it's 55, 45. Um, it's usually skews a little bit farther in the other direction for people, so more external than through Kickstarter. Um, and then you can get a breakdown of what those sources are. So you can see what press coverage actually yielded pledges, what features through the Kickstarter website, whether it's getting a staff pick or being included in a newsletter or something like that, brought the most backers to it. And you can kind of retarget your, your marketing based on that. And then you get information about where people are watching your videos. So whether it's through the actual project page or through embeds off-site. So you can embed the video and you know, often blogs or people covering the project will embed the video as well. And then you get a breakdown of your reward popularity 
right, so obviously that $15 reward has the most number of backers. Um, but actually the level of funding between that, that reward with 800 backers and that higher level of $1,500 reward that had seven backers, um, so they have way more reach as far as the number of people, but the, the levels of funding are much closer than they were previously used to. Are these projects available on the website for the future? Oh, throughout, yeah. So this is live data that you're getting about your project. Um, so that, yeah, the entire, the entire purpose of it is definitely to give you as clear a view as possible of how people are finding your project and what's really motivating people to pledge. Um, and, you know, we're, we're hoping to develop more and more tools along those lines to help creators do that. Um, so, just next steps, if you guys are considering, uh, if you have a project that you think would be right for Kickstarter, these are the things that we would recommend. First of all, spend a lot of time on the site. Look around and find projects that are in the same category as what you're doing. So if you're doing an app, definitely check out a lot of successful app projects. Or just things that have, you feel like, would reach the same community that you're interested in reaching. So even if it is a different kind of product, are you essentially trying to reach the same group of users? And and you know, see what see what they're doing as far as how are they presenting their video? Did they shoot their video on an iPhone, or did they, you know, have a large production budget to do it? You know, we see things in the full range could be effective. So, but just figure out for the kind of thing you're trying to do, what seems to be effective in reaching that community on Kickstarter. Definitely back projects. There's nothing like having the experience of being a backer and sort of seeing firsthand what feels genuine to you, what feels like it's motivating you to spread the word about the project, and also it's just it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to kind of follow the trajectory of somebody starting off and really continuing to develop their idea, even beyond when the campaign has launched. It's great if you're a developer or you're developing a product. It's a great way to educate yourself and see from an inside perspective how do, how do you go from getting funding to manufacturing to actually bringing the product to market. And that's Obviously, one of the really unique things about Kickstarter and what makes it so different from offering just a product on a store shelf is you're offering really the experience of seeing something come to life as much as anything else. Um, and then, like I said, get feedback from people who you consider to be kind of the core audience you're trying to reach. Um, talk to people, show them your, your project build, what you're considering um, presenting. It's, it seems like a really dumb advice, but um, you know, you'd be surprised how many times people don't think about their product from the perspective of somebody who would want to back it. And you can just say, well, if you were going to back this product, what would be the five things that you wanted to have answered? Or, you know, if I was watching this video and I didn't already have years of experience with what this is, would it actually clearly communicate to me what this thing does and why it might be interesting? Um, and then, you know, obviously tell people. Like I said, a big thing, uh, a big important aspect of getting a strong start with your campaign is building that network of people who are going to immediately get that notification that you're live and want to come back. So the more you can go to events like this, the more you can kind of showcase your project, and get people who you think are your core audience excited about it and kind of gather their contact info, the better position you are to have that strong start that everybody wants. Um, and then, by all means, talk to us. Uh, so I'm, as I said, community manager for design and technology. It means I work directly with creators who are at every stage of the process, from just, I have this idea, I'm not sure if I'm ready for Kickstarter, I need help developing it, figuring out who else to reach out to, um, to I'm ready to launch, I have this thing ready to go, um, can you give me some last minute tips? Um, you know, and to, to supporting people throughout the campaign and helping them figure out how to really make it most effective. So for any top level category at Kickstarter, you can email, so in this case, design ad or technology ad, but this also applies to music ad or food ad. Um, you can email, send email that, and it'll go to somebody who has a specialization within that area who can kind of help you um, figure out how best to use Kickstarter. Um, so I hope this has been somewhat helpful, um, and I'm happy to take any questions you guys have.